We are recording. Okay. So the second of three normative theories as presented by uh, Kevin Lynch in his book, Theory of City Form, is the city as a machine. Last week we did city as an organism. And next week we're going to be doing city as a cosmos, uh, getting into the spiritual religious aspects of urban formation. But this week we're looking at the city as an instrument of reproducing itself for whatever purpose, um, for various purposes uh, throughout history. And that helps us understand the present moment and your challenges uh, as we approach peak human, when you reach peak career uh, success and authority and responsibility around the decades of the middle of the century, around 2050, uh, what will be useful for you to uh, know in order to face those challenges? So remember, this is uh, our mission here is to send messages, uh, to do some time travel, anticipating the challenges that you will face at the peak of your career. What must, what do you wish you had learned back in college, back in 2021, 30 years ago? Um, and so we're doing our best to predict that. And these are our topics, Greece, Rome, Tenochtitlan, otherwise known as Mexico, which used to be the name of a city, now it's the name of a country. Barcelona, the United States, and if we have time for it, a little bit of Chicago. So planting the seed, uh, this, this question gets at the heart of this course. Um, when Manuel and I, once again, we start with a critique of education uh, in the 20th century. And when Manuel and I studied architecture back in the 20th century, uh, we were taught architecture as if it was uh, only an aesthetic project. It was uh, an artistic endeavor. And as an artistic endeavor, uh, it was non-instrumental. It was a reflection. And some would go so far as to call it a passive reflection of the values and norms and principles of society. Uh, we abdicated our responsibility as designers. It's not our fault. We didn't make the system. We did not produce, we're, we did not produce this system. We just do what our clients tell us. Well, those days are long gone as we've been reminding you throughout this course. Here in the 21st century, we take a hard look at the challenges facing us, uh, the formidable challenges. We take a skeptical attitude towards everything that came before, judging by the outcomes of the 20th century and the previous generation's efforts. It wouldn't be unreasonable to say, let's do the opposite of what we did before. Let's consider the possibility that what we did before as architects was exactly wrong. And let's see what happens if we do the opposite of what we did before. And so the opposite in this case is that architecture is not a passive reflection of the norms and values of society. The opposite of that would be architecture is an active instrument for the reinforcement and reproduction of the norms and standards of society, of the systems of our, our current arrangements. And those include arrangements of economic uh, systems, of social systems, of political systems, all of those systems that operate in our society and really establish a structure within which we all operate. Remember when we talked about structure and agency? Uh, to the extent that architecture is a physical manifestation, that is a instrumental physical system that reinforces and reproduces those systems, then we are at the heart of the operation of those systems. So this question gets to, the, gets to that issue very directly. 
We are so used to thinking of maps as being the passive reflection of the geographic features of a place. There's a river here, there's a mountain range here, and we map it. And maybe there's a town in the valley, we map it. Maybe there's a road, we map it. First comes the road, the town, the river, the valley, the mountain, and later comes the map, the passive reflection. But wait a minute, not so fast. This lecture is all about the opposite of that where uh, you could be a thousand miles away from the actual territory, the actual landscapes, and you could draw a map that is not a passive reflection. It is actually a blueprint for the production of the landscape. Uh, here in the 21st century, we are coming to grips with the fact that there is no nature that remains untouched by human influence. The entire planet, and increasingly off-planet, is a piece of the built environment. It is subject to design and architecture, the operations of design and architecture, of human intention. And pretty soon, Mars, well, already, Mars uh, and various uh, asteroids, uh, and off we go. Off-planet, the, the system of reproduction continues off planet. And it has actually been the focus of a uh, thesis project for a base on the moon, based on the principles that we cannot do what we did to the planet Earth. We must bring a different operating system to the moon, Mars, the asteroids, etc. Good luck with that. So far, the whole space exploration is being driven by uh, uh, not only are we not uh, reversing the principles of extractive capitalism because we don't have to worry yet about indigenous species, indigenous peoples uh, that we encountered in space. We haven't encountered any yet. The principles of extractive capitalism are put into hyperdrive and we just extract the hell out of everything off planet uh, in the most brutal possible way. Very interesting thesis project by Tim El Elric a few years ago, who is now doing a PhD or he's heading towards a PhD in aerospace engineering and the implementation of his thesis project. Um, so, wow, that was a tangent, but here's a case where the map is a blueprint. The map is a design and it produces weird things like this corner. Um, so what? It, why is this road this way? Is this the safest way to lay out a road? No, hundreds of people every year die at these intersections when after driving 24 miles straight in a straight line, suddenly there's a 90 degree turn. Um, and they go straight into the ditch on the far side um, and die or get injured. So why is the road like this? We will ask you again shortly. So let's start in Greece. Greece was an imperial power and they spread through military conquest throughout the Aegean. You study Greek temples in history theory one um, uh, but you probably did not fixate on the relationship between the Greek temple and the landscapes upon which they sit. This turned out to be a very important aspect of the Greek temple as explored uh, by Vincent Scully in a really wonderful book that came out, I think, in the 1980s. Um, but the Acropolis in Greece uh, is the exemplar of this commanding uh, landscape, uh, the, the monumental uh, construction of the, uh, Panth uh, the Parthenon uh, positioned in a very specific relationship to the rest of the landscape. And those arrangements were, were very much codified by certain specific religious and spiritual rules that also had implications for the ordering of society. And even to the present moment, we talk about 
the agora, the public space of public, of social exchange, of political ideas, the marketplace of ideas, uh, the public sphere. The agora is the original place of democratic communication, uh, and we still refer to it. So it still plays a role in our consciousness and in our culture. Uh, and in the way we think and act uh, on cities. The theater, the Greek amphitheater, is this very careful architecture, but it's not just the building. It's the relationship between the building and the landscape. And you see here a forest that is established as the backdrop to the drama that is played out on the stage. There is a human scale to the Greek amphitheater that has to do uh, as we saw last week, um, when the Adzan climbs the minaret and uh, performs the call to prayer for the uh, believers uh, within the sound of his or her voice, uh, there is a human scale to uh, settlements that um, Muslims do not live beyond the uh, call to prayer from the minaret. Similarly, there is a human scale to the Greek amphitheater the theater size is limited by the acoustic qualities that can be produced through this architecture. As the Greeks uh, reached out and uh, conquered other people, um, uh, once you conquer other lands, how do you hold those other lands? Who are you going to call? What are your instruments for holding those lands? you call the architects and the architects offer an urban form that is capable of demonstrating the superiority of Greek intellect, Greek political systems, the Greek economic system, and the Greek system of economic and military control. So the grid is a very convenient way of designing a block and then quickly reproducing that block designing an architecture that fits within a system of blocks and then uh, press the copy and paste button and you can replicate very rapidly these cities. So the key attributes of the Greek urban form is the grid itself, uh, its modularity, its replicability, and the uh, in breaking with the grid form, the non-uniform, the informal, the the topography uh, then has an impact on the surrounding fortification. So a uniform modular grid inside the walls and the walls itself are, are determined by other forces, not the grid. Um, the topography, the uh, shoreline in the case on the left, um, and here's Greece itself um, where it started, I mean Athens, the, core city of, um, of the Greek uh, operating system of, of towns. Um, and so we, we see this layout uh, playing out on, an, on a non-planar uh, landscape. So uh, the grid, like San Francisco, denies the reality of the topography. Uh, you, you remember from informal settlements, um, when we have a steep hillside, what we do is we walk along uh, the flat topo lines. And so our paths through the informal settlements are, are more or less level walking along the topo lines and then are crossed by stair streets that run, run directly down the fall line. Um, and so this grid is a denial of the topography until you get to the edge of the city, in which case the fortification does follow the topography. Now, as you studied in History Theory 1, we know that the Romans uh, emulated uh, or outright uh, stole and copied all of their architectural principles from Greece and then added things. And so you studied Rome, uh, the layout of the city of Rome is a lot more like Caracas, Venezuela than it is um, like an ordered grid. As is often the case, as you know, Boston, 
the original layout of cities uh, can be quite um, uh, seemingly chaotic. Or now that we've had city as an organism last week, we can now uh, say something a little more precise and a little more nuanced that the city is um, follows uh, a, se a series of rules that reflect a very complex reality. So again, this is the form and the language, the design language of complexity is what we're seeing here. There are forces, we could unpack this, we could decipher this if we probed into it the way we did the Islamic city. And I hope you believe that. Um, the Noli plan, again, 1746, um, showing the, the accessible spaces of the interior of the architecture, something that continues to be uh, an important method for representing urban fragments as architecture today. And in your studio, if it hasn't happened yet, it will soon happen uh, that your instructors will say, uh, I suggest you make a Noli plan of uh, what you're looking at, your site. So uh, you're expected to understand what a Noli plan is and how to produce one. It is more than just a figure ground. Um, and so here's the Roman version of the theater. Uh, it's been urbanized in this instance. You look down the street at the center and you see nature beyond. Um, uh, I'm going to move fairly quickly um, through a lot of this material. Rome itself, back to that idea, Rome itself is quite uh, the product of a lot of different forces, extreme complexity. And when Rome uh, reached out across the planet, it, um, it's, it, it simplifies and becomes a clearer system. Just to remind you, we looked at the Radiant Garden City Beautiful, and we looked in the City Beautiful in particular, uh, the idea that visual alignment down long axial corridors is a very powerful driving force. Um, and so you see the transformation of the city of Rome by Pope Sixtus V um, for the Jubilee year in order to encourage pilgrimage to Rome, the transformation of Rome by the cutting of boulevards through the dense fabric of Rome in order to produce these grand axial viewpoints. Um, that then that idea comes back again and again. The most famous one that you will recall from History Theory 2 was Haussmann's transformation of Paris uh, in the mid 19th century. So Rome uh, was not the only uh, imper um, uh, imperial civilizing force. You had uh, the Mongols um, in, in yellow, uh, Persian, uh, India. You, it was just one of several global hegemonic forces. But we tend to focus more on uh, the Roman uh, expansion um, because it, um, while the Mongols only conquered part of Europe, uh, the, the part that is currently in Russia, um, they could have, but for various reasons, did not succeed in conquering all of Europe. The big imperial conquest were the Romans, and this timeline kind of presents um, the long history of Roman conquest. And Roman conquest was kind of like a Ponzi scheme where, uh, or a pyramid scheme, uh, a chain letter. If you please uh, send me a dollar and send this letter on to six of your friends and they should all send you a dollar and me a dollar and uh, everyone in the world will be rich. Well, that is illegal. That's called a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid scheme. And, um, but that's how the imperial system of Rome worked. Once uh, the Roman armies, the legions, conquered a town, it, it, the military force of the Roman legion expanded 
by enlisting, conscripting the popul the men of that town as Roman um, soldiers. And it became their job to then conquer uh, the next town over and on and on until we reach Scotland, um, where they get pushed back to Traj Hadrian's Wall, Trajan's Wall, two different walls in um, the British Isles. Um, but you get this sense, there's this uh, this reaching out and this uh, conquering project. And how does this conquering project work? Um, it works through the design and construction of a road system uh, that continues to uh, exist today. And they built such good roads that uh, many of them remain in use uh, 2,000 years later. Um, look how deep that road bed is. Notice uh, the arc of the crown of the street. This is a, a design, basic design that remains unchanged. Europeans still build roads about half that depth. In North America after World War II, uh, our road depths were about 10 inches because uh, that was an experiment in planned obsolescence. We have boosted our road building standards, but it's more or less the same. It's, a, it's simultaneously a system of, uh, of providing a weatherproof surface upon which hooved animals and wheeled vehicles can travel uh, smoothly so that uh, the idea is whatever design allows uh, the most distance to be covered in a single day of travel wins. And this was the winning design. And that crown and the, the drainage, it's simultaneously a conveyance system and a drainage system. Uh, nothing is ever flat in the real world. No matter how flat it looks when you look out the window, Every surface, every engineered surface that you are looking at in the world has a minimum 2% pitch. For every um, foot of horizontal travel, there's a minimum of a quarter inch drop. That's something that architects need to remember. So here we see a drawing by architect um, uh, David McCauley, who became famous for his children's uh, books, illustrations, which are great illustrations of these systems. Here you see the origins of the crosswalk when uh, Will Ferrell in the movie Elf uh, hops from one stripe of the pedestrian crosswalk to the next uh, when, he, when the elf comes to Manhattan. He was, he probably didn't know of this, but he's basically replicating uh, one of the three systems or, or the reconciliation of the three systems of the Roman street. The first is uh, wheeled vehicles need to be able to pass along the road. Second is pedestrians need to be able to cross over the road. And third, the road itself is a drainage system. So it might be muddy, it might be wet, it might be filled with human excrement. Um, it'd be nice if we could cross that road without um, getting our feet wet in a way that doesn't uh, restrict the motion of hooved animals and wheeled vehicles. A brilliant system that remains uh, in use today. The other system, the remarkable engineering accomplishments of the Romans, they took the trabeated structural system, and you'll see my horizontal and vertical hands. Um, you use a different system for the vertical structure and the horizontal structures. So you have columns and beams in a trabeated system. The Romans took the Greek trabeated system and they reconciled the horizontal and the vertical in a vaulted system. So those are the two basic uh, approaches to structural form, the trabeated system, the vaulted system. And so the vaulted system results in these remarkable engineering accomplishments, the aqueduct, uh, again, is a very precise piece of engineering. As architects, we need to understand uh, that if they pitched, if they pitched the water course uh, insufficiently, puddling will occur. The water will become fouled, uh, and 
it, the aqueduct is considered a failure. If the pitch of the water course is too steep, the water will travel at a high velocity. It will produce a scouring effect, which will quickly erode the mortar from between the stones. So they had to get it just right. <clears throat> the, the key um, thing, and this is the first clue as to uh, the, the solving the mystery of that road system in that first slide, is um, the soldiers, when they arrive at a new place, they need to uh, establish the grid of the Roman town. And so uh, this is a system called centuriation. The root of the word centuriation is century, which is a base 10 system of, uh, of dividing the land into tens and then again, tens again. And these names of the soldiers are centurions because one of their primary tasks is to extend the Roman grid system uh, out from Rome across the Mediterranean world. And so in the ideal situation where there is no topographic feature to interrupt uh, the grid, uh, David McCauley gives us uh, this uh, hypothetical Roman camp that then becomes, moves from camp to a town to a city. And so you see the Cardo east-west main street and the Decumanus, the north-south main street, crossing at the Forum. Uh, the market, there's the amphitheater, the theater, these key features of the Roman operating system. How do we extend Roman control across the landscape? Step one, conquer the people. Step two, establish your grid, extend your grid. And the grid is coming from the city of Rome through a system of orthogonal land uh, partition across the landscape, across the entire Mediterranean world. Here we are in Timkad, North Africa, where the extension of the Roman operating system um, uh, was realized in a way that was very close to the ideal form that we see uh, illustrated by David McCauley. Uh, almost perfect square on a flat piece of land uh, with all of the key elements of the Roman operating system. You see the amphitheater. If we zoomed in, you'd see the agora, the temple, uh, the baths, all of these key systems. And you see Roman settlements that transform the towns that they encounter, uh, such as here in Great Britain. Here at Lake Como, in Italy, you, you can tell, can you, can you see where the original Roman walls were? Um, it, it should jump out at you. Um, we're gonna do a little uh, test here. Um, does everyone see how to uh, draw on their Zoom screen? So um, please uh, click on the annotate tool and see if you can, um, and in a moment, I'm going to ask you to, um, to do this little test. Okay, here's the city of, I believe it's Florence. Yes, there's the cathedral right there, um, Brunelleschi's Dome. Um, if you will, please turn on the annotate tool and uh, each of you please outline what you think is the original Roman town at the center of Florence. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Jaime. So there seems to be a consensus. Okay, thank you. So now, um, so when when the original Roman town, uh, when the original Roman town,
I'm just going to try to get the tidiest of these. Okay. When the original Roman town grew beyond its, its boundaries, uh, people started to settle outside the wall. And at a certain point, uh, there was a decision taken, well, we need to protect those people too, the suburbs, the uh, piece of the town beyond the walls. Now, with the same tools, can you outline that second wall? Do you see the pattern in the streets? Patrick is outlining the third wall. Joseph and Patrick and Emily have outlined and Sal have outlined the third wall. Thank you. Yes, Logan is outlining the second wall. Joshua is outlining um, a lot of uh, the third. So, okay, yes. Now that's the second wall. Thank you, everyone. Now, where is the third wall? That's the fourth wall. Emily, Joseph, that's the fourth wall. Do you see a third wall? Third wall is harder. I think is to something here. Okay, so you get the idea. Now, does it cross beyond the, the at what point do we cross the river on the on the south side? of um, the river. Thank you, Jaime. So here we are. Um, you are now, uh, I feel like we should give a certificate. Um, you are now uh, trained decoders of the urban fabric. Thank you very much for playing our game. Okay. That was fun. It, um, boy, I used to show this. One, two, three, and four. Yeah, the, the some walls go over the river. They are, they are. Arnie, yes. And, and you can do this for other you can do this for other cities. Um, you start to see these things. Once you've seen it once, you start to be able to decode things. Now the last point about the Roman operating system is it it reached out across the Mediterranean world and you still see it today. Once it gets imprinted on the surface of the planet, it is almost impossible to erase. Okay, Manuel, the show is yours. Yes. Okay, I can continue with <clears throat> with the application of the system of the same operating system in other cities. And let me see if the slideshow can. Do you want to share your screen? Out? Do you want to share your screen? Okay. Let me. Yeah, I want. I, I'm going to do that. Are you, can you hear me? Yes. So the slideshow <clears throat> is this one. <clears throat> Let's see how it works. <clears throat> it's working. If you click on uh, yes, the tab it's taking time it's very slow isn't it yeah click on present and it should work tab present yeah participant mute more now you see, here. it's here. next to the yellow share rectangle. It's the white present rectangle. 
Ask your, here, this one, ask your question present. Yeah? Um, try clicking on it. <clears throat> Anything happening? <clears throat> No. So maybe no, I should. Okay, no. No, it's. Yeah, I mean, maybe you should continue showing the the one you had, and I eliminate this one. Okay. Uh, because this is too slow. It's too. Okay. Okay. Find Tanakh one. Okay. And I'll do this one. Then. Oh, yes. <clears throat> okay. So we jump. We're jumping from Roman city to in, in this uh, city as machine to Mexico contemporary times. The city of Mexico, Tenochtitlan, and uh, Robert. Well, it's very difficult to pronounce. In in it's, it's Nahuatl. Nahuatl is the name of the language. And the two volcanoes at the end of the noche of this big esplanade were the, are the Popocatépetl and Ixtaccíhuatl. I remember them because I lived in Mexico for a year, and we used to we used to go everywhere. And the the, the fact that you see here is that Mexico has been the most the longest living city in the history of the urban world because it has been on like a like a city like active city 10 or between 5 and 10 centuries before the rome before christ so this is this is a lot of time and in when the spanish came to 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 america they discovered mexico was a very prosperous city very uh, was a very um i would say um traumatic in some ways because it was a city where many methods of bad treatments to, there was a slavery there was a, but there was a sophisticated organization and basically urban organization are you do you want me to advance so this experiment okay it, 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 okay let me let me let me know if it doesn't Okay, now you see the original situation of Mexico as a lake, as, as a whole lake that contained uh, the, this ideal city with the center and a grid. And you would say this is pre-Roman, uh, this is pre, uh, pre, completely pre-Colombian. And the thing is that the, the Spanish felt so comfortable came in, coming to the cities in, in Latin America because they had the structure already settled. settled. They had the they had the the city and these are the same axis the roman axis of east west south north south in this case the plaza the zocalo called plaza del zocalo occupies yeah this i think you're gonna need to to, to click to pass it around because it's gonna be here from here it's not doing anything okay another views of the city of mexico Tenochtitlan, with the volcanoes in the background, the two bigger ones to the right, and the lake. And there was a legend that mentioned that this this was this city was going to be uh, founded by a serp by a, by a seal by a serpent pl plum scent, uh, serpent like a feather scent, uh, serpent that will land in this place and will found the city and that. That was what this, they, the people from the city, the Aztecs, saw in Pizarro when he came and conquered the city from, from outside. He came with horses, he came with other elements that were not known in the, in the, in the place and transformed the whole society into colonial, uh, as a colonial and, and more, uh, more um, I would say, um, sophisticated in some ways, but at the same time, uh, oppressive society, very oppressive society. Next, please. 
I want to, okay, the, the base of the stem of uh, uh, rules and regulations and laws that came from Spain, from Madrid, in the, uh, after colonial, uh, when the colonial established uh, mechanism of power in the whole continent, which was big from North America to, to the south of the Patagonia in, in Argentina. And the, the, this was a territory divided in the two big, in the two big, uh, Emperorships from the time, which were the the Portuguese and the Spanish, and they they established this set of laws or regulations that called the the leyes de Indias or Indian laws uh, of the reign of the reigns of the emperorships of the Indies, and this contained not only it's important to, to realize that this is not only the rules of society. They had then the rules of like constitution, had a set of rules and regulations on how to organize society, how to organize trade, how to organize relationships between the, the people, but also the physical results of the space. The, situa the, the conditions where the, the, where the inhabitants could, could have deal with issues of Re restoring the land, re bringing the land together, putting uh, uh, the, the families took some hierarchical issues in terms of coming to the center of the city or in the periphery that, that meant something different. All that was written and dis distributed in the line, the layers of India. Now, next please. This is the, the, the front, the front cover of the book of the laws of India. But this is uh, there is a co coincidence in time, it's a synchronic, I would say, coincidence that looks at the another vision different by, by the one we saw in the Indies, but, but si similar in terms of uh, co coincidence in terms of the time elaborated by Thomas More called the utopia. Utopia was a no, well, the, the, the definition is, is really uh, twofold because the definition points in different directions. One is the utopia as no place. So that is a place that never existed and never will exist because it's utopian. It's no place. But there was there was a layout at least in this these are layouts of the utopia as an island as well as a, an island connected to the to the continent somewhere. And the other aspect of the word utopia was ideal place. So in one sense was no place, and in the other sense was the place where everything was perfect. And we have used, or architects have used that in, in, in order to establish a set of rules and a set of uh, good uh, practices in terms of architecture to, to, to make a better living for society. And that, that's why utopia has been used as a, as an ideal place as well. But both coincide some more, more or less with the establishment of the laws of India. And next, please. We can see so in uh, how that applied in different cities. This is in Mexico, still the, the plaza in the case of Mexico, as you can see here, was the monumental space that, and the cathedral to the right showing the, the scale of the place. There were, in this picture, when this picture was taken, there was not discovered the, the ruin. This corner, this corner was open. I don't have the annotation, but the, the upper left corner was open for, to, to extract some, to, to extract some uh, pieces of a, of a pyramid and some of the temples that existed in the place that were completely, completely different, but that was in the same place where they did, they were the Spanish did the, the main plaza and the soccer. Next. So uh, starting with Mexico, that has so much uh, history. I took the case of Caracas. Caracas being the opposite of Mexico, a modest province, uh, uh, moder modest uh, territory dominated with a geography that was exuberant and, and uh, what happened here? And with the with the topography and, and, and exuberant views and, and quebradas or, or, or rivers that go to them from the mountain to the river in the lower part. 
was originally designed in, also in Spain with 25 blocks in, in a geometrical, strict geometrical pattern with the plaza in the center and the church and all the power. The dimension of this type of Baroque uh, uh, landscape in terms of uh, grid was also the name, the dimension of the different parochias that came later. But the, in the case of Caracas, we can see the next one. You can, com if you compare the first 25 grids with the distance to the Caribbean in the north, and you compare with this uh, 200 years next to, I think, 200 years later. You can see this is a change, this unfortunate change in orientation, but this, this shows the, the, the atmosphere of the grid in the landscape. So the beginning, this city grew starting with the grid. There was nothing there before. And at that point, they started with the grid, found the, the, the whole issue of foundation of the city, and it grew in a different manner, in a different, like, with different typologies of cities something that happened differently in other cities in Europe and I will see I will show you the case of Barcelona so in this case you what you see here is the, the, the settlement the first settlement and then in the 1930s and 40s the the the, the advent the, the coming of the car and the individual car and the of course the, the explosion of the oil industry uh, made a strong, very, very strong and very rapid uh, advancement in, in towards the growth of the city that did in something like 20 years or 30 years grew amazingly um, something that haven't happened in, in the first 300 years earlier. And then along the, with the help of the, the automobile and the new technology of, of roads that were meant to be uh, fast fast roads that will penetrate into the east, especially the east, also the south of the city, but mainly, mainly the east it was because there were haciendas. All those spaces were haciendas that, that represented points where the people used to go and work and come back to the center, but that, that changed the structure and the working happened to move to the center and the living started to happen in the neighborhoods to the right. Next, and these are not by coincidence. The, these are also the map was made by the oil company. So, in that end of the the, the, the 19th century, in a peaceful this peaceful city of the roof of the red roof, was also blessed by the by the the religion. The city actually was named Santiago, in on on the on the same name of the of the uh, saint in in. Santiago de Apostol, Santiago, and like Santiago de Chile, Santiago de Leon, de Caracas, the lion was an animal uh, made uh, that was pointed out as being the, the protector of the city. And the city grew stable like this until the 1930s when it exploded, the explosion that I mentioned before. So, so the, you can see in both scales of cities, this is Caracas today, where this grid, some, there are some areas where this grid stays, per, per, continues, and has been deteriorating, like in this part of the center where there was no allowance to, to construct because there is no zoning ruling. This, the zoning allows what happens in the other side, in the, in the, in the west side of the, of, the, of the principal avenues that separate the quadrants of the center. And in the other side, you see the, the chaotic, chaotic, totally chaotic development of a city that didn't organize it, the, it has, the, itself according to some regulations like the ones that are even for the laws of India. So from this view of Caracas in 1960, we jump to Barcelona. Next. And um, the, the second case that I want to show is the view of Barcelona, a, a city that could be as chaotic, chaotic chaos as Caracas, with a density that's really strong, and with a, is what is called a compact city. This is the diag diagonal next. 
showing the, the, the growth of the city in the last 20 to 30 years towards the, the Mediterranean. So this diagonal runs to the Mediterranean. And we have, uh, we took material for this, this from this book, Manif Manifold of Grids and this, the Cerda plan, who was the planner of the Barcelona in Sanchi or example, which was the growth of the city of Barcelona from a Roman city, then, okay, we can talk about here in the valley. This is the valley the, the, that generates the space for the city. This is the Lobregat the river. The Lobregat has a delta here in the, in the Mediterranean. And the place for Barcelona is the little valley north to the delta. And this mountain, this little mountain that I don't have a way to show north, I mean, move here to the compass. Is Montjuic is a place where the Olympic Games were ha happened in, in 1992. This valley, uh, uh, moving uh, west of the of the Montjuic, is the is the growth of the Sanchez Cerda, and you can see here. Uh, I went, well, let's get closer to next one. So I, I, bring, I bring Barcelona later because this is the development of the grid towards the excellence and the, towards the real uh, sophistication of the grid based on, on even on the experience of the laws of English because this, this grid is much, late, much later than the grids that you were using in the South American case. Next. Okay, so this is... Okay, this one I wanted to see. This is the original Roman city with the two axes crossing in the center. And this is the foundation of the Cardos Maxim and the Cumanos Maxim. And this in this corner happened. And this is the original wall that you could have an exercise. You will see next slide, you will see the traces of the wall. And the, within this wall, there are some open spaces like in the, in the Roman time. And there was the place where they installed the cathedral and the and the cloisters. And this shows, okay, look at you see the 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 the, the wall surrounding. This is the wall exposed now. This is, but this is the Gothic city. You, okay, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. And this shows the the first enclave of the Roman city that founded Barcelona that expanded and this is the moment where the romans they didn't when they don't continue and the the city seemed to the, the medieval times the growth is completely this is called the gothic city and the gothic city is a random organized according to other rules city that has in this drawing i like very much to stress like a like a figure ground it's a mix of a figure ground with this it didn't only map because it has some interiors of the buildings. It has some, especially well, the corridors, of course, and has something that is very famous and very important in Barcelona, which is Las Ramblas. The Ramblas is this originally a river, a small river, that was taken and it's called Las in plural, Las Ramblas, because each one has a different name from Plaza Catalunya in this north, in this position to this corner. From look, this this ramblas each one has a, a own personality and also relates with the neighborhood. So, the lower uh, the one is, one of them is called Rambla de la Flores of the flowers. One of them is Rambla, is more oriented towards market and, and food. One of them is is more uh, close to immigrants, closer immigrants. And this, for example, this uh, this this part, you see a small rambla also from here to. You, you can indicate it here, there's a small ram, rambler here to the left. And you start by looking at this as a, a summatory of spaces that inter, interlock with each other and create the, this very strange atmosphere of a medieval city that is very coherent and you can get lost very easy. It's like a labyrinth, but you can enjoy the best spaces and foods and elements that you can find in following some criteria that's a good access as well because this goes to the market of Santa Catarina which is this one square the square 
that used to be a, a convent among in the, in the medieval times transform itself into a market by the architect um, um, the architect uh, Miralles. Miralles is one of the young architects. Unfortunately, he died very young and he left several good, very uh, unique work in the in this this uh, several areas. Next. So look, we are the Roman city enclave within the Gothic city, and then we will see the Gothic city enclave into the. Okay, this is this one is more. These are some analysis that that uh, Busquets makes about about the Ramblas and other other horizontal communications and some spaces that are surround uh, next to the Ramblas. There are some open spaces that he analyzes as well in more detail. And here, well, to the right is the same, the same going. And we didn't talk, but we will see the port and the harbor close very well. This is Columbus Avenue in next to the coast and then the port. Next. So the, the views internally, the Gothic city, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing, it's a, difficult to describe. The, the, the amount of places and the, the connections that they, they have on top, like this one, which is the Generalitat. This is the political, the, the offices of the president of the, of the commonality, the state, like the state governor, the house of so both together, connected also with the church. So there is also a power of the, the strong element of power of the church. Next. So by while in Latin America they were doing the grid, expanding the grid in, in Barcelona they was doing the, 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 the Gothic city. Or uh, finishing the Gothic yeah, the, the, the medieval times and more or less simultaneously in the after Columbus in 1549. 1449. Okay, these different approaches to the city and planning. You can see the, the, for example, within this one, you have this, the plan Cerda, which was finally the one that was realized here in the, in the left corner. This was the, the number five was the originally the one who won the competition, but this not, was not realized. And this, the Corbusier and Cerd had the opportunity to plan this, the, uh, make a plan with the Gato Park group that they founded. And they were especially served emerging as the new um, vision of the relationship between architecture and the activities that work in the city. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in the other grid, the way this grid. So they basically took the land and uh, opened it as much as possible to establish uh, a different and new, complete, uh, completely different um, layout or 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 mark in the territory or footprint in the territory next so we are the plan the plan that we're going to get closer the, the cerda plan in 1859 or, uh, or 1860s you can see in more detail here and i want to show in here how the expansion of the grid if you see in, in detail this is the gothic city this this one to the left of the of the Gothic city is the the Montjuic where where the games were realized in the top of the hill. They built the stadiums and all the all the facilities for for the play the games, and they the the grid basically the the the, the neighborhood was this was territory for agriculture and all that, and there were some some small towns separated and all the hill here. And this is the barrio de Gracia, it's called Gracia. Sarria is in this area of the wall. And you see other, other enclaves that represent other parts of the city that they have to be, they were separated uh, until Cerda came with this plan. But this plan has been realized by phase, by etapas, by, by steps. So this was not, this is the vision of the plan that uh, Cerda had for the whole plan. And you will see more or less the situation how it is now. This, this is analyzing the different 
Rose son components de diagonal you know, appear as the one, the longest one, from corner, basically from corner to corner, the north corner and the, the Mediterranean here. And there was an attempt, to, well, it's not in this map, but the Villa Olimpica is here. So the gains were realized here and the Villa Olimpica no 92 was in this area. And this was called Forum 2004, another event called, called with that name, Forum 2004, that uh, was exhibitions and like a world fair that happened in this corner and allowed to develop pieces. So they have the plan, they, they, the way they work is that they, they, they base the, the whole plan of the city in Cerda 1869 plan, but they develop projects within the plan. The, the development of each project represents a new work, a new approach, and taking into account the new way to see the city. For example, now, unfortunately, I didn't bring it, but you will have the chance to see the new, the new approach is the macro block. They call it the, the super blocks. They are trying to join blocks of three in order to create high speed avenues that go faster, which they want, like this, like the center, the, this one, like the diagonal, etc. And north, south, as well, east, west, as well. So they have, and then in between, they are having uh, roads or streets that are completely pedestrian. This is the pedestrianization of Barcelona uh, by macro blocks, taking the the organization that way and exaggerating the speed. The speed is impressive when you go get into one of those principles. They are really, they are, they are too much um, for us that we're, no, we're not used to this type of speed. But this, the good thing is that the slow road, uh, paths are very nice. Next. Continue showing the work close. Okay. Okay, the uh, CERT and the Corbusier intervene in several projects. This one is one of the most interesting because CERT, this is called Casa Block. This was built and CERT in, in the, the developed a, in a new typology in this case of blocks that configurate by, by courier and the, the relationship between CERT and the courier is, is all in all his work. So even the work he has here in Cambridge in the Peabody Terrace, you, you, you understand the buildings through the courier, not through the building itself. In this case as well, the, the, in the system of uh, corridors every two floors, having duplex apartments, having the, the, the ground floor completely open and connected publicly, so there is no control on, on the land. Actually, the, the people was on, that work lives in the apartments don't control the land, they don't own the land. So the, the, land, the land belongs to the city. And, and this is a great example of something that works. It, it, it's one of the most successful uh, housing projects for, for, in this case, I think now they are living there, the, poli the families of the police uh, that were uh, policemen and in the time of the, when this was made in 1930s. So there is a long, long tradition of uh, property here of, of in this area. Next. And with next, we continue with Le Corbusier also. But this, this vision of Le Corbusier is more general. This is about the grid in general. This is the fact, the way of um, expressing the, the need that the, the grid would be clean the, the construction of the uh, housing in the future would be in towers and of course that this the the main problem of this uh, approach was that it tremendously cleaned the whole the whole land and and does not let didn't let any possibility of remembering the past and and also connecting the communities that exist this is just new and this was apl applied in several cities uh, as a project that never like in Paris, for example, that never worked. Next. Okay, these are just illustrations of the, the, the system that they could say. Next, the build radius 1930s coincide, coincides with the construction of the Casa Block. Earlier in the century, at the change of the century, there were, uh, there were examples of lecture that demonstrated that the grid that Cerda put in place worked, worked. And one of them is, is Gaudí. 
uh, Gaudi and it's a, it's a remarkable architect that has uh, several bi urban buildings in the city and churches and designed a park and he has but his work was only in this city. He never moved from Barcelona and the, I think and the close region. And this one, La Pedrera, is one of the examples that most uh, most beautiful uh, con condition for a corner. This this is uh, this parcel starts to express the conditions of the place. The corners are very important, and because all the grid that was proposed by Cerda was based in the idea of the corner of, of, of eight sides, like an octagonal corner. And so there is no corner in angle, strict angle, 90 degrees. No, always a, 40, a 45 degrees break and a corner like this. Continue and we we'll continue and we will see it. And that was basically, okay, this, talking about modern architecture as well, just a jump here of the pavilion, the Barcelona pavilion in 1929 for the exhibition, uh, that 1999, 1929, represent one of the big steps of, of, of architecture, architecture in, the, in the last century that fortunately, thanks to a group of architects from Barcelona, they rebuilt. This building was demolished after the exhibition because the, exhibi the exhibition took a temporary site and nobody resisted that for many years. They started the fight until they, they found the money and the way to, it's a, it's a, it's a good example of tenacity and, and pride proudness from the people of Barcelona to to, the, to do the pavilion and, and have it there and and demonstrate that modern architecture can be beautiful and also that modern architecture prevails and stays next for example if you compare this this picture with the this is a recent picture the day of the inauguration this is the, this is this this is the prime minister I think of well, the, actually, this was the Empire Astro Hunger, uh, Astro, Astro. So uh, this this is the, the, the inauguration of the pavilion, and people waiting next. Look at the wall, the marble wall back here. Okay, uh, other examples that have taken Barcelona, I'm not going to enter in much detail here, because this is about the construction of the harbor, and the harbor was not a natural harbor, it's kind of structured one. These are other examples of modern architecture that never built, fortunately, I think, because they keep, as you see, this is the way they saw the grid in the background without developing, but you, you, you will see what the grid means in terms of the real possibilities. Next. Okay, these are too dark, but these are views of the Olympic Village. This is the coastline. The Olympic Village uh, introduced an element of housing in the in the coast that goes along the, the peripheral road. This is a road that goes uh, the, to the whole city, and this road, uh, along this road, uh, there are connections with the with the, mar, uh, the the sea, and the and the con the continuation of the of the grid. So there are continuations towards the sea, and this was the coast from the Olympics when the uh, when the, the Olympic Games, the water the games were happening. There were there are swimming pools. There are sailing, of course, because of the of the installations of ports and all that. So this was the trace you can see it a little bit here. The construction of a harbor for for a sport facilities. The construction of a new extension of the grid and. The most remarkable part that you will see in, in another picture is the res the rescue or the the discovery the rediscovery of the beach the beach the fact that this city had originally con contact with the Mediterranean and was denied denied because of the construction of sewers so this was the back of the city uh, until 1992 when people like Busquets Boigas and some other uh, planners they, they redefine the purpose of the city and and put the city in the in the in the, in the geopolitics of the whole Mediterranean and and compete competing with others in that. So it's a great success of the city with a lot of tourism and study students and all that uh, de developing their activities uh, in a mixed city that is very interesting. Next.
Okay, some uh, are attached, re, re, related with the Olympics. There were some invitations of artists that tapies like this one made the, this intervention, or Gary made this one in the in the Olympic Village. Uh, Miro and other other artists that work. Next. Okay, the, the, this is the grid, go ahead, next. This is the grid in the territory, the, the location of the, of the, you can see. This is the Gothic city, the, the medieval city, with the wall indicating the limit, and the beginning of the final rows of the city, next. You, you can also see the harbor, which is like, not like in Boston. Boston has a, a very clear, very nice, and perfect um, geographic existing harbor this is a this is totally man-made the harbor is totally man-made this is the this is the olympic village in this area all, all this area is the olympic village and the rescue the rescuing of the beaches for the recreation of the population this is the forum 2004 the, the new forum ending the diagonal and now you see the now you see an amount of a grid that deserves consideration because it's all built with a mix of uses with a density that is a remarkable example of how a packed, compact city can be can be successful uh, in in our time so this this express the, the main part the big parts of the city as well this is uh, the, the harbor and uh, it is under construction all, all the time uh, okay more detail you can see from the contrast between the plan that Serdar left, Serdar left is with a zoning that distributed the, the activities somehow with a short dimension. These are the, the diagonal, the, the corners with the octagonal corners. And these are possibilities of, uh, these are the possibilities of the, of the grid, of the grid. Now, what you have here is the realization, the actual realization of the grid and you have the possibility of the, the, the idea of the tree, the macro blocks here very clearly. So the, this one is the high speed, this road, and the other one is high speed, is this one, and the other, the tree in the middle, the two in the middle are pedestrian and very slow traffic for ambulances or something, taxi or something like that. The rest, the rest is the grid. As Cerda evolved, the grid from Cerda evolving and growing and the, the last part that has been developed is the, the part closest to the beaches uh, in the in the north side of the city. Next. This is uh, what they call the ensanche. It's like it's not really ensanche because it's not grow. The growth is inside within. So the transform the, the, he called it the transformative unit as a unit that can create transformation and quality of life. So uh, several examples there are not only there are not only those that are corners with the the, the forty five degrees. There are other examples like this one. Like this this is a housing social housing following the the rules of the grid by Cerda and connecting themselves with the territory in, in the same system. So they, they don't create a disturbance in the point where they do. And, um, okay, this, uh, this, is the, the, this is the area where the Olympic Village was developed. Next. Okay, those details. Next, you can pass one of the diagonals here. Uh, the, the, the growth of each of the parcels with uh, level of details. This graphic I, I like because this graphic shows the different the different instruments, the different the different tools that the city uses for for its development that you don't see. These are okay. Next, okay. These are from parking in the top level to internal roads underneath to sewer. Uh, water, all, all the services are layered, layered here in a way that it's impossible to move and or to remove and this will stay forever and, this is, and on top of that there is a grid, a schematic grid here.
and on top of this is the Gothic barrio sign. And we're going to see an example in the Gothic that uh, it's called, it's very nice, it's called La Barceloneta. I'll show it. Next. Okay. La Barceloneta is, is one example of these spaces that are contained. They call it the military grid because it was, I think it was originally related with the military, but has changed too much in this in the span of time. This is next to the port. And you can see here that the, this is the industrial port, this is the Olympic port, the, in the, and the beaches. So the beaches start right in this point. This is a transition and has transformed itself into a real, real good place to, to go for food or for enjoyment or for just for, or to understand the city. The, 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 the rare thing situation that creates here is that the size of the block the dimension of the of the open spaces are very curious, are, are very out of scale, you would say. But they, the people seem to enjoy it and live very, very nicely. So next, it's like something that you sometimes have in some towns. This, this is based on the medieval town. Look, look, this is the Barceloneta from the beach. Look at the spirit of the beaches. And the, the, the path the, in between buildings, the blocks actually are very narrow. And you have this narrow corridor, and then sometimes appears a plaza like here, and the rest is just the example of the the, the block divided. They call it military grid, but uh, oriented towards the beach in one direction and towards the center of the Gothic city in the other. Next. Okay, well, this is, I think, uh, this is the, uh, the last, okay, this is the last one, the beaches, the, the life of the beaches and the presence of the city in the front, the waterfront, with uh, that shows more or less the possibilities of the city that, that based on the, the element of the grid and based in the, con the continuity of the density and the mix of activities you can see as a very promising place to live in the future. I think this is the last one. You wanna... There's this one and... Uh... We're under the... This is... Oh yeah, this was the last one. This is a vision of extending the Forum 2004. This one, and this is the 24, 2004, and this is a new development, and there is some other new developments in this area. But this is all looking for expanding the grid into the north area, because this is, this is the port, this is the Olympic Village around here, and this is the port. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Manuel. So this is, um, you know, the, the important you. important point to take away here is that yes, uh, the Greeks and the Romans used grids, but so did uh, the the Mexica tribes of Tenochtitlan and um, the cities of Spain and Portugal were not based on grids. They were, uh, I mean, there was the Roman grid at the, at the core of uh, Barcelona, but uh, the, uh, the development since Roman times was not strongly gridded. But when the Spaniards arrived uh, at the at Tenochtitlan, uh, the site of Mexico City, they were so impressed by this city. It was the largest city any of them had ever seen, larger than the cities of Europe. And they were so astonished by the accomplishment the, of the urban form of Tenochtitlan that they took back this appreciation of grids back to Europe and started to develop gridded cities um, once again and to establish it in the law of the Indies as a as a system of colonial conquest as we studied it in history theory too 
Um, and so the grid operates as a system of conquest. Um, and conquest uh, in both the sense of the military uh, sense of the term, but also in the sense of economic reproduction. <clears throat> and so in 1811, uh, when Manhattan Island was more or less uh, a town uh, confined to the area below Canal Street, <clears throat> at that time, they needed to come up with a way to tame the landscape, uh, both formally in terms of uh, urban form, but also economically. And it turns out, um, the key takeaway here is that when you have a standardized block pattern of parcels, then the parcels themselves become an extremely powerful method of reproduction. Not only can you reproduce your street grid and infrastructural systems, but you recreate identically sized parcels. In this case, every parcel of the 1811 Manhattan grid is 25 feet wide and 100 feet deep. And once you've divided this entire island into parcels that are all identical, you can design of, of housing, you can design a building, a tenement building, and we did look at this in history theory too. And once you've designed it, you can you only need to design it once, and then you can just copy and paste. You can replicate those buildings across the city at, at, with extreme economy. You can also buy and sell parcels. Uh, if I want to buy land. It's useful that every piece of land is identical to every other piece of land. The one exception is you can have corners. Um, and so either the parcel of land is on a corner or it's not on a corner, but it's the same piece of land. So I can buy one, I can buy 20, I can buy a thousand. They're all the same. I can buy this one or that one or the other one across town. And what this does is it creates land as a commodity. It becomes an equal, it, be, it becomes an equal element, a modular element that allows there to be a market of parcels, similar to what we've discussed before, the way markets work is a, bush, a bushel of corn in Antwerp is the same commodity price as a bushel of corn in Amsterdam, a bushel of corn in London, a bushel of corn in Barcelona. So throughout the Mediterranean world, a bushel of corn is the same. And the same thing is true about the commodification of land. They pretty much uh, erase as much as possible the differences between this piece of the planet and that piece of the planet. It's the exact same parcel. And the only difference is how close is that parcel to things like markets. And so it's the same logic in, uh, that we see in the 1811 plan of Manhattan as we see in the Jefferson, Jeffersonian grid. When Thomas Jefferson became president of the United States, I think it was 1800, someone correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, uh, he established, he anticipated the expansion of the 13 colonies beyond the Appalachian Mountains. And instead of using the system of meets and bounds, that is the system that uh, is used to establish the parcel boundaries of most New England towns, meets and bounds, head on this compass direction for this many feet until you hit the tree, then turn on this compass direction and go uh, 23 feet until you hit the stone wall and then go on this compass direction. It's a very complex and cumbersome way of uh, demarcating land parcels uh, in the old system of New England and of England. So the Anglo-American system of meets and bounds uh, produces unique parcels. Every parcel of land is different from every other parcel of the land. It's a different shape, it's a different size, it's, and there's an emphasis on the distinctness of every parcel. In contrast, this modular grid system that Jefferson proposed 
in the uh, land ordinance uh, that was passed uh, establishes a system of a six mile township grid that you see here. I believe you've seen it before. This is the basis uh, for all land parcelization beyond uh, the, um, the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, Jefferson proposed this ordinance in 1785. It was later passed, uh, I believe during his presidency, and it didn't really come into play uh, until uh, later in the 19th century uh, when um, uh, the early colonies expanded beyond the Appalachian Mountains and quickly uh, 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 was flung across the continent um, first, step one, again, step one, conquer the landscape, uh, sub, uh, military conquest of the peoples who exist on the land before you, the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Uh, when Columbus landed, it was estimated, uh, new estimates of the population was something around 20 million inhabitants of the Americas. And of, of that 20 million, in the first uh, decades after uh, European arrival on the Americas, uh, there was a, a devastating loss of population, primarily through unfamiliar diseases. 95% uh, of the population uh, was lost. So only 5% of the original inhabitants of the Americas survived the original arrival of the Europeans. And then from there, things did not get much better. The rest was a, a system of conquest that depended very much on the establishment of these grids. And within these grids, all kinds of different patterns um, have been um, put in place. So back to this question. Does anyone know why it is we need to uh, shape the road like this? We've had a chance to think about it. Any ideas? You can put it in the Brightspace chat. You can put it in uh, the Zoom chat. Um, I'll give you one more moment before I reveal the answer. Or you could turn on your microphone. Any, any clues? OK, here's a hint. Has anyone ever uh, tried to gift wrap a soccer ball or a basketball or a volleyball or something that's not a rectilinear box? If you could imagine trying to wrap a basketball as a birthday present, um, it's, it's hard to do. It's harder to wrap. Um, it's harder to to wrap than a box. Oz says to preserve the roads. No, the roads came later. Um, this was open prairie land. The roads were laid out according to the blueprint of this modular grid. So this is the result of the modular grid being overlaid on something that is difficult to wrap in a in a, a modular grid. Why would a grid not properly sit on this landscape? Uh, Denalia's uh, taking a good shot here um, to make a special a special pattern. The easiest way to split things utilizes the most space. Um, think again about this the problem of wrapping a soccer ball uh, in wrapping paper. There are going to be wrinkles, right? So um, this is a flat piece of landscape, right? It's, it's a little bumpy at the mountains, but there are no mountains in this view. So how, where, why would there be wrinkles? Thank you, Logan. Logan wins the prize, the curvature of the earth. Notice that these 
the, the latitude lines that run east to west are parallel to each other. The longitude lines that run north-south are not parallel to each other because the earth is curved. And when you point your compass to due north uh, and you try to keep these lines 24 miles, exactly 24 miles apart, and still run those those uh, north-south lines pointing at the North Pole, you run into the problem of the curvature of the Earth, that the, the longitude lines, the meridian lines, uh, are not parallel to each other when you look at the planet. And so uh, if, if any of you are looking for evidence that the Earth is not flat, you can uh, look at these roads. And um, you see an interesting thing uh, is that these roads, as you go across the planet, uh, as you drive across country, uh, you'll notice that these roads um, get closer and closer together as you arrive at the principal meridian of the, the grid layout. Um, it's just a fascinating thing that... Um, that demonstrates with uh, dramatic clarity that um, maps are not a passive reflection of what is there. Maps are often an instrument for the transformation of the planet. And when we get to other planets and satellites, uh, you will see that. Um, and so uh, now I'm just simply going to refer you to this history of conquest. You see in this brilliant painting on the right, uh, as the grid comes across from east to west, the savages are swept off the landscape, the dark clouds lift, the triumph of civilization, um, the angel, the Aryan vision of the blonde woman, uh, scantily clad uh, Aryan civilization, European civilization, st stringing telegraph wires across the continent. First the covered wagons, then the pioneers on foot, the stagecoach, and then the steam-powered locomotives. You see the Brooklyn Bridge off to the right uh, and New York Harbor. Um, and you see fences. Fences are a very important part of this whole formula. Um, and the, uh, the deforestation of the continent and um, the bringing of commodities from across the landscape into Chicago and out of Chicago on the canal system uh, to New York. So the reason New York City is the empire or New York State is the empire state is because it was the final end of uh, the Erie Canal that the commodities were brought from across this vast landscape of the Midwest of the United States uh, to Chicago through this system of infrastructure, the gridded roads, the railroads, the canal system across the Great Lakes, down the Erie Canal, across New York State, and uh, eventually uh, to New York, which made New York the Empire State. This continues this theme that we've been seeing throughout is that you can't understand London until you understand the colonies, the colonial empire of the British Empire. You can't understand Amsterdam without the Dutch Empire. You cannot understand Barcelona without understanding the Spanish Empire. And you can't understand New York City without understanding Chicago and the American Empire, uh, the conquest. Um, the Great Chicago Fire, which uh, eliminated balloon frame construction and gave us platform frame construction. Um, I'm moving quickly because we've, we've seen this before. We studied Chicago at length. Um, we talked about the land speculation that financed the construction of the transcontinental railways, that because of the railway, uh, the uh, all land uh, within several miles, uh, many, you know, 50 miles in this case, of the railway increased in value. And by selling off those parcels in markets in Baltimore, 
in Boston, in New York, you could buy and sell parcels of land without ever seeing them because of the grid. And as the value, uh, anticipating the arrival of the railway, the value of those parcels were expected to go up. So you could sell those parcels based on the future value, the promise of future value, and use the profits of that to finance the railway itself. It's the same mechanism that we see in the city of Dubai today. So uh, it, this is an, an example of, as we struggle to understand Dubai, we, um, we look at history and look at the development of the United States as a way of understanding uh, the operation of property values and real estate in Dubai. We also understand uh, the informal settlements and why uh, the people in the New Earth reading were not interested in actually owning the land uh, and the difference between proprietary rights over their land and property rights over the land. So this is another reminder. Uh, the burning of Chicago gave the architects a chance to rebuild the city from a dirty, smelly, stinky wasteland into the white city um, that we studied uh, so thoroughly in history theory too. Uh, and the city of Chicago becomes part of this continent-spanning machinery of the transformation of value that comes off the land into the wealth uh, of uh, pork, beef, uh, the meat industry, uh, etc., as facilitated by the infrastructures and the architectures um, that are not just in Chicago, but spread the architectural uh, design that spreads across the continent. And that's the lecture. So if anyone um, wants to hang back and talk about anything, please do so. Otherwise, um, have a great weekend and we will see you all on Wednesday.